Well, hello everybody, and what a beautiful sunny day it is this morning in Devon. Uh, I'm here looking out of my window in Colleton, not very far away from those bats in Beer and Branscombe. But I want you to fast forward with me for a minute, and it's now dimpsy time. That's my favourite time of day. And in case this is a word I only came across when I moved to the southwest, but dimpsy time is the time of pixies and fairies. It's the time when birds stop twittering in the trees and the world just becomes peaceful for a minute as the sun disappears. And as I'm standing with my bat detector close to a bat roost, this is what I hear. And I think anybody who's heard that spine chilling sound of the greater horseshoe bat can't fail to be excited when they know that they're in the right place and the bats are actually there. Because these are not common animals and people do come and visit us from other parts of the country in the hope of maybe seeing a greater horseshoe bat. And it can be a little bit of a joke if you're in a place where there are lots of horseshoe bats and it, you know, we say we're knee, knee deep in them here, almost like vermin. Didn't mean to do that. And if we peep inside the roost, this is the sort of thing that we see. Not at all quiet. Here we've got a hive of activity. This is from, if you want to see more of this later, go on to the Greater Horseshoe Bat website. And you can see these marvellous images. This is inside one of the Vincent Wildlife Trust reserves. And you can see the activity of bats. This is in fairness from a couple of weeks ago. Where the bats are all talking to each other. They found this amazing place where they can breed. It's right in the middle of an area where there's lots of food for them to eat. And what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk, think about, first of all, why greater horseshoe bats are protected. Why should we care about them? Then think about the mechanisms that we have in place currently to protect them. And finish off by thinking about some of the challenges. What do they actually need? What do we need to be doing now in order to preserve them for the future? Okay, so. The greater horseshoe bat actually has a very wide distribution. And a lot of people may not realize that it, it does stretch right across to Asia. And at a global scale, the red list status is actually least concern. Okay, it's widespread, it's doing quite well in parts of its range. But it's also fair to note that if you go onto the IUCN website, you'll see that the population is noted as decreasing. So while not yet currently considered threatened, there is, uh, this is a species that we need to be keeping an eye on at a global scale. If we zoom in now to Europe, we actually see quite a different picture. So here the green dots are showing places where the status is considered favourable. Okay, so this is places where the population is increasing and we know that there is availability of suitable habitat for them. And really we've only got two areas, so one is in Britain and the other is here, where you can see that the populations are actually doing rather well. Across most of the rest of Europe, the conservation status is classed as unfavourable and the habitat inadequate. Okay, it doesn't necessarily mean that all these populations are yet in decline, but basically there is a warning bell sounding that things are not good across most of France, Spain, Portugal, Northern Italy and so on. If we then continue, the, the red blobs are the places where the population status is considered to be bad. So here the population is actually in decline and or there's an obvious lack of suitable habitat for them. And in, in fact, the, the problem is so severe that in countries like Belgium and Netherlands and, the, and Malta, uh, also Gibraltar, the species has actually been declared extinct. And there are very severe declines in Germany and Switzerland. 
Okay, so I think we can, although a lot of people will be familiar with the idea that the southwest is a great stronghold in the Britain context for greater horseshoe bats, we might be less aware of this European scale um, picture. So the European assessments are both in Europe in the wider scale and the EU member states, the species is considered to be near threatened. If we look a bit more finer detail now to Great Britain, we can see very obviously that the range of this species is restricted. It's found in southwest England, notably in Devon, um, but also through the whole of the southwest peninsula and also in places like Pembrokeshire. Now, historically, we know that the population had a wider range. We know that it was found up to the Midlands, and we also know that it occurred as far east as, Ke uh, east as Kent. And it's therefore very exciting that just recently there have been a few records, um, horseshoe uh, bat detector records of the species in Kent. And I know that the Kent uh, bat group is working hard to try and track down any individuals. And we know also similarly that there are just a small number of individuals uh, currently known in places like Sussex. Nevertheless, the population has undoubtedly had a range contraction. The degree to which there's been a historical population collapse is a little bit debated. We're not sure exactly how many there used to be. Unfortunately, there aren't great historical records. But we can certainly see that things haven't been great over the past hundred years or so for the species. On the plus side, though, we know that the population seems to be expanding now. So in terms of its geographical range, we're getting these new records in places like North Wales. It seems to be spreading up the border uh, counties of England as well. As I say, we're getting these odd records uh, further to the east as well. So that all seems very promising. If you want more information about that, uh, I urge you to head to the Atlas of Mammals of Great Britain, which just came out earlier this year. And in terms of their population status, well, the good news here is that they do seem to be doing rather well. And we can say that with a certain amount of confidence. Um, we look at, this is the review of the population of Britain's mammals, uh, if anybody feels like reading it. And what I can tell you from that work is that there are only three other species that we know as much about, uh, the badger, the roe deer, and Reeves muntjac is the only other the only other mammalian terrestrial species where we can say that we know as much about their population. And this is basically because of the effort that a great many people have put into monitoring the species over the years, many of whom I know are on this conference call today. So if we try and make an estimate of what the population sizes actually are, um, so in the population review I did this based on maternity colony counts. Uh, the reason being that it's actually considerably easier to get sensible, reliable, reproducible records from exit counts and maternity sites than it is when you're doing winter counts in hibernation sites. So if we take at the time when we did it in 2018, there were 57 known sites. I think we're now up to 58 or 59 known maternity colonies, but anyway. Um, of these we used 33 and that's basically all the um, places where there were at least 30 individuals uh, on at least several occasions in that roost. Okay, so we take the number of roosts, that was 28 in England and 5 in Wales. Uh, we take the number seen and then from that we can infer a population size. And we can also put some plausible limits around those uh, estimates. So in England, it's ranging from, oops, sorry, around 7,000 to about 14 and a half. And the reason that we have those ranges is it depends on what assumptions you make about what proportion of animals in the maternity colonies when they're counted are female. So in other words, the upper estimate would be if you assume that all the animals are female, then somewhere you're going to have an equal number of males. So you need to double the number that you actually saw. Whereas conversely, if you think it's a 50-50 ratio, then your, your lower estimate will be reduced. And the population size was estimated on the basis of it being 70% female. 
okay but somewhere within there is plausible if we add in um, uh, an extra margin of error for the small number of sites that we don't know about we don't alter these numbers very much because we think most of the big sites at least were, are pretty likely to be known okay. so you know that looks like a lot of, of animals but how does that rank in terms of population sizes for uh, for all bats in Britain well you can see that they're pretty much right at the bottom of the pile so only grey long-eared bat and greater mouse-eared bat actually have smaller population sizes. Um, there's almost twice as many lesser horseshoe bats and I'm sure that this bears um, a comparison with most people's personal experience of how often do you actually come across a greater horseshoe bat. Even in areas of the strongholds it's actually not very often. These are bats that are rare in the countryside. And then if we think about how their, their um, population sizes are faring over time, you know, as I said, the good news is that this is a species that does seem to be increasing. If we compare the results of the current population review with the, the review that Steve Harris did in 1995, we've gone from a number that's around about 5,000 uh, across GB to something closer to 13,000. If we apply the annual rate of increase found in the Bat Conservation Trust monitoring, this is the high, this is the maternity counts over time. If we applied that to this earlier figure of around about five and a half thousand, we're still in in this ballpark here. So we've got a, a, you know a reasonable degree of confidence that we're, we've got these numbers approximately right. So what does that mean in terms of the red list status for mammals? Some of you might have seen uh, over the past year or so, there's been quite a lot of media interest in the new red list that, um, that we've made at the Mammal Society for, for Britain's mammals. And perhaps some confusion or, or uh, at least people feeling perplexed about why a species like the greater horseshoe bat isn't actually listed on the red list. And the reason is that the regional red list is very much looking within country and it's looking at trends within countries. And at the moment it comes out that for England, uh, sorry, for Britain and for England, the status is least concern and for Wales, it's near threatened. And the reason for this is if you go through, this is the actual, uh, you can go onto the IUCN red list uh, website and see all this in detail in your own time. But essentially, you have to go through a series of set criteria to work out whether species are threatened or not. So if we look in terms of population size reduction, uh, basically the population has to be declining, which clearly in Britain for greater horseshoe bats and in England, it's not declining, it's increasing. Uh, we also have to look at what the range is doing. And the range actually, if anything, seems to be increasing and it's above these thresholds anyway. Numbers of mature individuals, uh, again, is greater apart from in Wales and so on. So that is, that's basically the reason. So even in Wales, although they're vulnerable or they, they fall into this category of, of having fewer than 10,000 individuals, they don't fill this other bit of the criteria, which is the num about the numbers um, that are in restricted subpopulations. Okay. I thought though it was worth highlighting that uh, I, I don't think that horseshoe bats are out of the woods yet in, in Britain and that we still need to be careful, we still need to continue with our conservation efforts. And one of the reasons for this, in addition to the fact that there's still actually not that many of them, is that it seems that from the limited information we have that their genetic status may not be as wonderful as we would like it to be. So this is a piece of work that was actually led by uh, Orion uh, Turin in France and we just submitted some um, genetic samples for comparison with what's going on in the European population and using two sites, one in Devon and one in Dorset. And what we see is that the heterozygosity, so that's the amount of variability in, uh, in, from the genetic perspective, is much lower in our British populations. 
that may not be terribly surprising because probably it had quite, you know, Britain has been isolated from the rest of Europe for some considerable time. We don't think that there's movement of greater horseshoe bats across the channel, unless the work in Kent ends up showing something different. But we think that they're probably quite separate from the French populations. It's noticeable that this population in Calais also has quite noticeably lower heterozygosity than the ones elsewhere. In addition to that general amount of variability, we also looked at the inbreeding coefficient. Um, and this is a number where one would suggest that you're genetically identical to another individual. If you take any pair, if you take pairs of individuals, a coefficient of one would mean you're identical to them. Okay. So the inbreeding coefficient um, in the Devon population sampled was 0.12, which is actually pretty high. It compares with a maximum value of 0.06 for anywhere else in France, and most of them were actually 0.06 or lower. It's a bit tricky to compare across species because methods of, uh, differ between studies, but inbreeding coefficients like that uh, are also seen in things like the grey long-eared bat. And I'll come on in a minute to why I think that might be a bit of a problem and it's an area that we really need to be thinking about for the future. But basically we can certainly say that our British population here, if we look at um, how distinct these different populations are that were sampled across Europe, we can see that there's a slight difference between Tunisia and France and this is the Basque country and then England and um, the pooled samples here are really quite distinct. And that means that also in terms of conservation, it makes a difference because in France, basically, they can consider all of this huge area as effectively one conservation unit with animals moving between them. Whereas our populations up here are you're just operating on a much smaller scale and you've got fewer individuals to play with. Okay, so in addition to the European uh, red list status of near threatened, there's also uh, additional protection for uh, horseshoe, greater horseshoe bats under EU law. Okay, so all the member states of the EU have to establish conservation measures for for the bats and they have to protect, prevent any damaging activities that could significantly disturb the relevant bat species. Okay, so basically this is what we often refer to as, as Annex 2 protection. And basically there's a designation of sites across Europe which are put in place with the intention of protecting this species. And it means that for example, if a development is undertaken, then there's an obligation on a competent authority to conduct an appropriate assessment or an HRA, it might be called, to make sure that there's no negative effect on the population. So this Natura 2000 site network is actually very well implemented for greater horseshoe bats. If we look at the numbers across Europe, there's actually 2007 at the last count of designated sites. These are the SAC sites which is much better than for, for many other species. And perhaps partly that's because it's easier to understand the places where great Hi Steve, it's Sarah from Ethos, turning the call. Hi. Sorry, yeah, sorry. And it was all... um, sorry, can Sarah please mute herself? Sorry. Okay. Okay, so in addition to those Annex 2 provisions, um, which gives, to some extent, special status to greater horseshoe bats, along with lesser horseshoe bats, Bechsteins and Barbastels. All species are also listed on Annex 4, which means that you can't uh, do things like, you can't deliberately capture or kill them, you can't disturb hibernation site, and so on. Okay. So if we look just within uh, Great Britain, we can see where these sac sites are. And the red ones are ones that are internationally important and greater horseshoe bats are the primary reason for the designation. So those include places like the Box and Bradford and Avon uh, sac sites. 
and the South Hamsack sites. And then there's ones where greater horseshoe bats are listed, but it's not considered internationally uh, so important. And they may or may not be the primary reason for designating uh, the site like beer. So because of this Annex 2 protection, it means that um, there are measures in place to try and control the potential impacts of development that might affect the ability of bats to reproduce in these areas or to move between the alternative sites that they might need. And I know that there have been a great many people working very hard on the South Ham's um, supplementary planning guidance, um, which aims basically to try and identify places that could potentially be a problem where the developments uh, could Im impact on bats. And if you go on to the Devon County Council website, you can actually see this is quite a recent thing and I, I, re I actually really like it. It seems to be a website that actually works, so congratulations. Um, where you can zoom in, you can see the protected areas, um, which include the sustenance zones, uh, so the area is basically very close to roost, but then all this other area in between where we feel that actually those areas are still used by bats, they are still important. We mustn't just write them off and say we can do what we like outside those regions. Okay, but essentially there is a very strong focus on roosts currently in the legislative position. Um, we know that that has been very successful in, in particularly with the large roosts. We know that a lot of the, the of several of the large maternity sites in Devon in particular are doing exceptionally well. So Devon has, I think, still the largest maternity colony in Europe. Yeah, and that's great news. And the numbers there are going up, uh, up and up year on year, which is great. However, I think we do need to be careful about the smaller sites because it seems that actually population sizes there um, may be more variable. That includes both the hibernation and the maternity sites. And there's a danger that those sites can be to some extent overlooked. So if we think a bit more about what exactly bats need, well, they need, first of all, sites where they can hibernate. And that means that we need to be thinking about the amount of human access to those sites and things like the introductions of grills have been very, very successful across Europe in helping to reduce the amount of disturbance. And we can think about things like how much public access we're going to have in show caves. And I noticed um, that it, it appears from the Beer Quarry Caves website like they may be rethinking a bit about the amount of access that they're going to have during the winter in future. So I think those are things that we need to still be uh, a little bit concerned about and, and just make sure that the disturbance isn't excessive. Obviously it's very important to take people into these sites and also let them meet local bats and this is actually a school party that um, the AOMB arranged that they should go and, and visit the bats and find out about them. Grills aren't always the answer though. Uh, in a lot of places, this is actually a site that I go to regularly in Wiltshire, where the grills are actually constantly taken off and in a lot of places there is an awful lot of disturbance. Uh, some of that is because people like to go into caves recreationally, so you can find all sorts of stuff down caves, ranging from a Christmas tree to shopping trolleys, you know, all sorts of things. And sites in the southwest are certainly also used for braves, which of course can be very disturbing, particularly if they're in the winter time. But also I think there's a threat from more industrial sorts of uses. People actually use, uh, just love using underground sites to dump stuff, a lot of stuff uh, which probably would cost them money to dispose of properly. And there's also a threat of sites simply being blocked up quietly or alternative uses being made of the outside areas. So this is a site that used to just have a drift up to it. This is not a, not a Devon site, but just to illustrate where the outside has been turned into a car park and it's absolutely surrounded by these dreadful LED lights that are coming on every night. Yeah. So I think those sorts of things, thinking about access to these sites is really, really important. 
That's also need thermally suitable roofs. And I think this is one of the areas where organisations like the Vincent Wildlife Trust and others have really done huge, uh, made huge achievements to make roofs better for bats. And I'm sure that Roger will be talking perhaps tomorrow about the importance of temperature in improving the reproductive success of females. So modifications, things like incubators and hot boxes, or simply just re-roofing, can have a massive impact at the population level. I think an area that's had a lot less thought is the importance of mating roosts. Um, so when they mate, greater horseshoe bats, or male greater horseshoe bats, will occupy often quite small underground sites. So this is an example, they don't all have to be as beautiful as this with the roses, etc. Uh, I'm sure that the females would visit even without the roses. But under here is a male who occupies this sort of cellar area. And he's visited over the autumn by a procession of females. And actually you wouldn't know it was a procession of females were it not that we were actually doing a ringing study at the time and realised that these numbers were actually changing. So it wasn't, you might just pop your head around the door in the autumn and think, oh, only two bats, not a very important site. But actually these sites could be absolutely critical to the genetic health of the population. And this is work that um, I know that um, other, other groups are also interested in, in doing and looking at the degree of gene flow that's happening. This interesting stuff about the sociobiology of what's going on here because it seems that there's family groups visiting males at the same time and so on, which all of which may partly explain that reduced heterozygosity that we're seeing in our populations. If we compare these bats with some of the bats that use swarming sites, for example, you might have something like a Bechstein's bat, which although it's very sedentary for most of the year, seems then to be attending swarming sites where it has the opportunity to meet animals who've also come from quite large distances and do gene, and, and so you're encouraging gene flow in that way. Perhaps with the greater horseshoe bats, it's just more difficult. And these are the sorts of small sites that I think can very easily quietly be lost across the countryside and we wouldn't know it was happening. Similarly, bats also need night roosts. Now, they certainly go back and use uh, some of these underground sites during the night and it's the sort of thing you wouldn't realise unless you're hanging about at caves at 3am, which some of us do. But also they make use of things like barns and it doesn't even have to be a complete uh, structure like this. They're very happy with open sorts of structures like tractor sheds, uh, stables, those sorts of things. And I think, again, this is an area where we don't know very much about exactly what's happening in night roost, but we can conclude that they must be important because they're so widely used. And if you ever stick your head in a night roost, you'll see the bats busily chatting to each other, presumably exchanging information at the same time. It may also be that night roosts can actually act as stepping stones in the landscape that could allow bats to repopulate areas that they've been lost from previously. And I think there's some precedence for that work that Vincent Wildlife Trust have done in Wales of introducing night shelters for lesser horseshoe bats to help them kind of reach areas and be able to explore them before then uh, perhaps going on and forming new maternity colonies. So it's very encouraging that one of the Devon Bat Project's new night roofs was occupied almost instantly by greater horseshoe bats. And I think it's, it's going to be interesting to watch that in the future and see whether new maternity colonies start appearing in the region as a consequence. They also need high quality habitat and particularly close to the roost. And Finch is going to talk more about this later on um, in the next talk with work that he's been doing looking at uh, habitat quality and the movement of animals through landscapes. But I just wanted to highlight the point that when we take data from now a large number of studies that we've done where we put bat detectors out, uh, concentrated uh, the deployment of many, many bat detectors around bat roosts, what we find is that the probability of finding bats declines very rapidly the further you go from the roost. And that's partly a function of space. 
if you think about it as, as you increase the size of a circle, you're increasing, for each meter you increase the radius of the circle, you're increasing the area by a much greater proportion. But also there's a propensity of bats to want to stay close to roofs, particularly um, during the period when they're suckling young. So they want to keep going back so that they can feed the young. The consequence of that is that while there is a large roof sustenance zone through which bats disperse, your probability of actually picking them up in the landscape actually becomes very small, even though we know that they're using this large area, your probability of finding them on a bat detector becomes small as soon as you, uh, with the increasing distance from the roost, okay? It doesn't mean those other areas aren't important, but what it does mean is you don't find them very often. And um, coming back to the point about areas easily being overlooked in terms of their importance, I think we need to be very careful, um, particularly during um, development sorts of works, that we don't overlook areas that actually are important just on the basis of the fact that we didn't find many bat calls there. That may be actually the number you would expect given the distance from the roost. And certainly, Bats need good ways to, um, to move between these various sites that they need, between the maternity sites, the mating sites, the hibernation sites, as well as their day-to-day -day movements for foraging and night roosts. So some of the work we've been doing on that uh, is first of all radio tracking and we've done a couple of projects in, in East Devon before this, uh, the Devon Bat project started using normal VHS tracking and running around in the night uh, searching for bats, which did yield a lot of information. It's damned hard work though, I don't mind saying. Um, and it only gives you partial information because you've only got it on the individuals you actually managed to follow. And one of the things we're interested in exploring at the moment is whether actually we can use newer techniques uh, of perhaps having static masts in the landscape so rather than people running around, these will automatically detect where the bats are. And also just this year, trying out the use of coloured rings on one of the sites. This is an underground site, which is not currently known to be connected with the South Ham stack. And what we're hoping is that other people will spot these green ringed bats at one of the SAC sites, either hibernation or maternity site. And then we'll have definite proof that these populations are connected. Okay, so I'm just going to finish off now by thinking about some of the threats and what we need to need to really be thinking about to protect them for the future. Um, one of our big concerns is the impact of artificial lighting, and this is something that my research group have been doing a lot of work on over the years. Basically, we know that greater horseshoe bats prefer being in dark areas. Their activity reduces considerably even with things like household lights and more so with street lighting. And one of the things we were playing about with last summer with the help of some of the Devon Bat Group volunteers was looking at the impact of actually altering the spectral composition of light to try and make it less harmful. I think our, our results still suggest that while you can make some improvements by tweaking spectral composition, still by far the best option is keep light just where you need it and only when you need it, because bats still prefer the dark, they're creatures of the night. In terms of road lighting, what we know is if you put out paired detectors in the landscape, this is a roost here, blue means this is a dark area, yellow means that it's a area with a street light. So we've got pairs here, so if you can see, that's a, that's a blue and this is a yellow, that's a blue, this is a yellow. Basically, all the big blue blobs, this is places where you get most bat passes, are in the dark, even where the habitat is the same. And the other interesting thing to note is that we seem to have a lot of bat activity along our minor roads. And as I'm sure we'll all know, a lot of our roads in Devon are minor roads with double hedgerows, quite narrow. Actually they provide pretty good foraging opportunities for bats and lots of shelter from those hedges. And it looks like the scale of the effect from lighting is much greater on these minor roads than it is on a major road. So what we need to be thinking of is actually 
individual actions by parishes, for example, uh, to put up a street light on a junction on a country lane or in a car park in a rural village and those sorts of things might have a much, much greater effect and kind of go under the radar compared with something that's on a major road scheme where you've got a whole army of consultants looking at the problem. The impact of roads doesn't just end with lighting either. So Finch did some very cool experiments looking at the impact of road traffic noise where he actually recorded and played back road traffic noise to that. So we had linear features, hedgerows basically, and a number of speakers set up that was playing reco recordings over and over again for a couple of hours of road noise. And basically what we had is a couple of nights with no noise to start with and then nights where noise was played. And there was an absolutely massive decrease in the amount of bat activity. And most of the, the passes in the first year of the project were actually Greater Horseshoe bats because we worked in Greater Horseshoe areas. And then he later went on to show that actually the impacts extended to other species as well. Um, so it looks like this is a very general effect that noise from roads disturbs bats which is interesting also because we thought that maybe horseshoe bats might be slightly different because they echolocate higher, but actually it seems that most of the effect is owing to the impact of sonic um, noise. So it's the, the noise that you and I can hear rather than ultrasound. If anything, that's a bit worrying because ultrasound doesn't propagate very far in air, as you're probably aware. And so it means that ultrasound from roads doesn't actually spread very far, whereas the low rumbly sort of noises does actually travel quite a distance and it's quite a difficult thing to mitigate for. Clearly bats also need food and in terms of places that are going to provide suitable shelter, big overgrown hedges that Devon is brilliant for and also feeding perches, things like the, the standard mature trees in hedgerows as well. And they need a mosaic of habitats that are going to support the moths and the beetles that they're going to need during the year. And one of the things that we've been looking at and we're particularly concerned about is the impact of veterinary pharmaceuticals on bats. And this is uh, the work of a systematic review showing that where you apply uh, anti-worming treatments uh, to cattle, there is a huge decrease. So this is if there was no effect, um, all these different studies would show a blob here. This is the control where no endecticide is applied. And this is where the endecticide is applied. And you can see basically endecticide, application of endecticides means that you reduce the availability of food for bats. And it also seems to be a bit of a double whammy in that for adults, you actually get a higher probability of adults occurring on endecticide treated cow pats. So it's, it appears to be that there's probably some attraction to treated dung, but then the larvae don't actually develop in there. So it's in a sense acting as a, an ecological sink. And I know that this is something that will be talked about more tomorrow. I think Anna's going to talk more about uh, ivermectins and other treatments. So in summary, Great Britain is a real stronghold for bats internationally, greater horseshoe bats. And within Europe, Devon is absolutely a key region and we ought to be very, very proud of that. We need, though, to make sure that we maintain the network of small roosts and particularly the mating sites. I think it would be a mistake to have too much focus just on the very large sites, which I think are doing very well. And we now need to think much wider. And in order to achieve that, what we really need to do is continue the brilliant work that the Greater Horseshoe Bat Project has been doing and make sure we continue with very coordinated landscape scale approaches to conserve this species for the future. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Fiona. What a brilliant talk and loads of questions coming in on the chat function. Um, I think we have got um, time for just a couple of those questions at the moment and then we're going to have a break until about 10 past 11 
Um, and then after the next two talks from Eleanor and Finch, if you're okay with that, Fiona, we'd like you to come back and answer a few more questions as well. Um, so I'll just hand over to Mike and he's got some questions that have been coming in on the chat function um, for Fiona. So, so Mike, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that no, was a great talk, Fiona. Um, as, as I said, it's generated lots of interest. Um, it's a nice, um, easy one to kick off from Mark. Uh, how is Brexit perceived to affect conservation provisions for great horseshoe bats? Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, happily, hopefully, fingers crossed, <laughs> it won't be too bad for two reasons. One is because most of the provision should be being moved across into domestic law. There's, I don't see any great move uh, to undo most of the fundamental protections for bats. Um, whether or not the big Boris bill push will have more of an impact, I think we have to wait and see exactly what is coming out of that. Um, there is some protection, so you might be considering particularly the Annex 2 status, and it's important to say that the, the Annex 2 status and the Habitats Directive was basically our way of implementing uh, across the EU, the, the um, Berne Convention. And we are still signatories of the Berne Convention. And so like a few other nations, we're gonna become what's called an Emerald Nation, which means that we should still be abiding by everything we signed up to in that convention. It's really the main issue is that if the if we break the terms of it, we as in the country breaks the terms of it, there is no court to go to. Uh, unlike previously, we could be taken to the European court if we fail to implement the Habitats Directive properly. So I think that's the issue is where does the buck stop? Um, you know, maybe people will just break the rules and, you know, <laughs> what's, what's going to be done about it. But I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I think we've probably got time just for, just for one more, um, one from Julian. Uh, are big roosts a strength or a weakness, um, I know it's linked to that, uh, and do they reflect a lack of availability of suitable undisturbed roosting opportunities? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think, I think what we actually want is lots of big roosts. I don't think that it's big roosts are a bad thing. I think perhaps more the way to think of it is it's a bit worrying that we have so many of our eggs in such a small number of baskets, because if there were a catastrophe at one of these very big roosts, it would ha have a massive effect at a population level. So you know, my suggestion would be that actually strengthening the network by having a lot more availability of suitable sites would surely be a good thing. <laughs> 